We have a lot of uh, celebrations, a lot of events with friends and family members. How many of you guys, and this is the beautiful thing about living in Colorado, how many of you guys went and cut your own tree this year? Raise your hand. You took the family? Handful of you. That's awesome. We couldn't do that in Arizona. There was, there was no trees to cut in Arizona. But here in Colorado, it's a beautiful thing. It's a time where you, you're building memories. And, and for those of you... Some of you have that, the Clark Griswold gene, right? You gotta, gotta get your house all decorated nice and all the lights and the festivities, and it becomes a huge event, and that's awesome. Um, we have theme parties, right? Cookie parties and ugly sweater parties, and, and you have parties at your work to celebrate that you guys are still around for another year. It's just a, a big time of celebration. Uh, again, we get visits of friends and families, and you're creating memories. Uh, just the other day, uh, we, we were around the fan, and we were looking through pictures, and, and we looked back 10 years of just celebrating Christmas and all the videos and, and the kids, how they have grown. It just brought a, a joy to our heart, to our family. Um, and then we have the first-timers, the first-timers that are getting to celebrate Christmas. Maybe, maybe you just got married this past year, and this is the first time that you get to spend with your spouse you get to create your own traditions, your own rhythms as a new family. Maybe you, this is the first time you get to celebrate with a newborn, a new, a new child that you added to your family. Or your kids are at the age that they, they kind of get what Christmas is about. They get the festivities. They, they get that they get to wake up at 4.30 a.m. tomorrow uh, to wake you guys up to go and open presents. I don't miss those days. We're waking up at 9.30, right? 9.30, Maddie, right? 9.30, Okay. But it's a beautiful time. And, and here's the thing, too, a white Christmas. Now, many of you guys have maybe lived in places where you had snow. I grew up mainly in Arizona, and we never had a white Christmas. I love that I live in Colorado and get to wake up to a white Christmas snow out there. It, just, it brings it all together. You get to build snowman. In Arizona, this is what we got to build. This was the Arizona snowman. Let's see if we have it up there. Come on. There we go. There's the Arizona snowman. <laughs> That's what I got to build every Christmas season, right? We, get to, we live in Colorado, snow, white Christmas. I mean, it's a wonderful time of year because we get to all these festivities, all these memories that, that are being built. And, and on the Christian calendar, it's also a special time. We, we can even make the argument that it's the most important day of the year, that Christ, God, became man, became born of a Virgin Mary and, and dwelt among us. Of course, there's Easter. Easter is important, but we know without the birth of Christ, without his life, without his substitution and life lived in our place, there could be no death on the cross to save us with our sins. So without the incarnation, God becoming flesh, there would be no Savior. And without a Savior, we'd have no hope and no peace. But because Jesus did come, there is good news. Some 2,000 years ago, Galatians 4.4 said this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoptions as sons. What a great truth. What a great night. On that night, God put his redemption plan into motion physically by sending us Jesus. What was talked about way back after the fall in Genesis 3.15 about this, this man that's going to come and crush the head of Sinai was finally coming to pass in the perfect timing. What a truth. God became man to redeem you and me and thousands of us throughout the centuries to adopt us as his own sons and daughters. It doesn't get any better than that. There's no better news than that. And there's no better time to celebrate or thing to celebrate than that, that God became man. And over the past three weeks, we've been studying Advent. We've been talking about the responses to Jesus, to the baby in the manger. And we looked at a number of responses, and we've seen several positive, life-changing responses and reactions that we can adopt now as well. They just weren't for Mary and Joseph. They were for us as well. They just weren't reserved for the angels and the shepherds. They were for us as well. And as you guys recall, Mary and Joseph, this young teenage couple, probably 13, 14 years old, they they responded to this baby by by falling and being obedient to the word of the Lord through the angel of Gabriel saying that, hey, you're going to bear a son. You're going to call him Jesus. He's going to save your people from your sins. And, And they walked in obedience to that command. And then we, we looked at the angels and the angels' response. 
The angel's response, in, and, and that was that of worship. First there was one angel that showed himself to the shepherd, and then there was multitudes, and th- some commentators think all of heaven showed up at this one event to sing glory to God in the highest. Now they were with Jesus since the beginning of creation, and they saw Jesus do miraculous works from saving Israel from Egypt, from parting the Red Sea, from David's time and Solomon's time, the rise and fall. And yet, the only time we see in Scripture that all of heaven shows up is at the birth of Christ to make this announcement. And it said the angels worshiped. And then we see the shepherds. The shepherds, as we know, were the outcasts of society. They were low on the totem pole. No one dealt or met or did anything with the shepherds. They were outsiders, And yet, the Lord made his announcements first to them, to them. And we saw their response. Their response was worship. Their response was evangelism. They went immediately into town to tell everyone about the news that they had just seen and heard from the angels, about this Christ, this Messiah, this King who has been born in Bethlehem. And that was their response. And last week, Rich talked about the Magi, these these wise men who came from thousands of miles away to see and to worship this king. And then also we had Herod, the one negative response. Herod refused to worship Jesus. Instead, he he chose to make war. And I pray tonight that if, if you come in here and you haven't Uh, receive Christ as as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't repented of your sins and trusted in his life for you, I pray this is the night that you would do that. You would see the glory of the Lord in Christ, his salvation plan for you, and don't be like Herod and reject Jesus. So these are the responses, but there's one more response that I want to point out this night, and it's in Luke chapter 2. Verse 19. And I believe if we get the principle of this, it will kind of put a, a, a bow on top of our Advent season, so to speak. You know, over the past three weeks, we've covered about 50 verses from Matthew and Luke, and we looked at the Christmas story. And, and, um, and while it gave us great details on this event and how to respond, I think Luke 2.19 gives us Mary's response. And I think it's the perfect summation and the perfect response to Jesus. And this whole situation, this whole event, and this is what it says in Luke 2, verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Isn't that an awesome sentence? Doesn't that just capture the moment, the event? Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary, Mary's 13, 14 years old. She's a 7th, 8th grader. My daughter's in 8th grade. She's around her age. And yet here's the wisdom and the response from this young lady. Taking in all that she has gone through over the last year of her life. It says that she treasured. Treasured means she preserved what she heard and saw so that it would not be lost. What are those things that you treasure in your life? that you have kept over as you've grown, that, that you treasure, that you preserve, that you know exactly what that event is, what that celebration is, or what that thing is, that you know where it is so it won't be lost. This is what Mary did with Jesus. It said pondered. The, the word ponder means to, to throw together. So what Mary did is she put all the events in the last year of her life together and thought about them at this moment. She treasured. She pondered. All these things in her heart. Well, the question is, well, what are these things? And I want to go through that with you. And, and immediately we, we see that there's a number of things that she went through over this year. We're going to highlight, I don't know, eight or ten of them. But I almost see this as a, like a, at a movie clip. And you guys know what I'm saying. is like I can see the shepherds at this time in this context are there. And, and they're telling her everything that you know, has taken place. Jesus is born by this time. And, and I can see as the shepherds are talking... Mary, their their words kind of fade out, and she just has this rapid succession of memories over the last year and all that the Lord has done in her life. And there were good times, and there were bad times. So let's, 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 let's go through what she was pondering. First, she was pondering to kick off the year. She got engaged. She was a young woman, and this man, young man Joseph, came and, and asked her to marry her. 
What an exciting time. What anticipation. You, you remember those times, ladies, when, when your man came and proposed to you, the feelings that you had? That's how Mary's year started off, with those butterflies. And then as, as, as she said yes to Joseph, she meets this angel, Gabriel, who tells her she's going to give birth to a child while she's a virgin. All of a sudden, that elation, that excitement went to maybe it's a little bit of confusion, right? She was stunned, a little bit overwhelming. There's two reasons why that that's overwhelming. One, the, the, the Lord has been silent for 400 years prior to this angel, Gabriel. He has not spoken to the nation of Israel. It has been silent. And then all of a sudden, the first time that he speaks in 400 years is to this young woman. It doesn't say like, hey, Mary, repent and believe. It says something a little bit more out of the ordinary. You as a virgin are going to give birth to the Savior of the world. A little bit overwhelming, right, ladies? And second, again, you're a virgin. And by the Holy Spirit will come over you and you will have a son. And then Joseph, her fiance, gets a hold of this. And he's freaked out a little bit. In fact, he says, I'm done with you. You, you went out and had an affair. You committed adultery on me. I, I, I'm going to cast you aside. But then the angel Gabriel meets him and tells him of the message. And Joseph believes. Mary went from extreme high to all of a sudden extreme low. Joseph went to an extreme high, all of a sudden to extreme low. But Joseph, being a man of character, comes in and and he believes Gabriel, and, and, he, and he loves and encourages and is a rock for Mary. But they still have to deal with the shame that the people in the village look upon them because they see Mary went out on Joseph, and Joseph is still with her, and it was a, it was a slap in the face to them. They dealt with the glaring, the gossiping, the murmuring. Oh, there's Mary and Joseph. And so for that time, uh, Joseph sends Mary to go spend some time with her cousin Elizabeth who also had a miraculous birth and pregnancy with John the Baptist. And, and there the two women can, can love and encourage one another and talk about their babies as they're flipping around in the bellies. And there's excitement and joy again. So there's a, there's a high point. And then all of a sudden Caesar Augustus gives a census and they have to make this 100-mile trip, Joseph and Mary, while she's probably in her third trimester just ready to give birth. She's got to travel 100 miles by foot from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And when they finally arrive at the relative's home, they're like, sorry. Got no place for you. You guys can sleep out back with the animals in the, in, the, in, the, in the cave. And so that's where they end up going. Less than ideal conditions, she gives birth. Wraps them in swaddling clothes and then puts Jesus in a stone animal trough. Highs, lows, ups and downs. And if it was that, it would be up. But then all of a sudden these shepherds show up. These strangers, these outcasts burst into the room. And you can see Joseph. Joseph is like probably getting ready to, to go to battle because these strangers come in. Who knows what they're going to do? And all of a sudden they start talking about these angels and who this baby is. And there's Mary just like, I just gave birth, you know, like uh, um, just sitting there. Highs and lows. Talk about a roller coaster year in life, right? Anyone had that kind of year this last year? A roller coaster year? We've all, maybe not like Mary, but we've all had roller coaster years. We've had highs and lows. Physically and emotionally uh, draining, a lot of joy, a lot of, maybe a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. And the principle is that Mary, all these things, treasured, pondered them in her heart. And it causes us to do the same. Some 2,000 years later, as we've gone through the story over and over again, as we're familiar with, as we just recount that, that the Lord wants us tonight to pause, to treasure, and to ponder the story of the incarnation, the story of God becoming man and dwelling among us, the story of Christ our King, the story of our Messiah, our Savior. Mary responded by putting it all together as best she could, and she treasured it. All the moments, again, the highs and the lows, the good and the bad. She treasured them. You see, some of the toughest months of Mary's life was during this time, this last year, I'm sure. You can think about the shame that she might have felt like she said, no, really, I'm a virgin. Well, then you're pregnant. Well, she dealt with that shame. 
Uh, she dealt with, you know, again, just, just the, the, the being a young teenager and, and, and having to make this trek from Nazareth to Bethlehem and all of a sudden get rejected by her own family, have to go have the baby out in the trough. There was a, a lot of highs and lows. I'm sure there was a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of tears. And maybe some of you come in tonight and you're struggling with some heartache. You're struggling with some, some tears, some, some pain, some hurt, some suffering from some events that may have happened this last year, some, some events that have happened in years past around this time, and it's heart-wrenching. It's, it, there's some ache and there's some pains, and I think Mary helps us look through this. I, I can relate. I think we all can relate on, on this trial and this season of, of struggling. My, I remember on December 17th, a number a couple of years ago, December 17th was my birthday. Uh, we, my family and I, we just get out of a movie, and we're, we're having fun. We're celebrating. I get a call, and one of our uh, Rita and I's great friends passed away. And all of a sudden, that, that high went to a low. And then tonight marks the 25th anniversary of my mom passing away on Christmas Eve at a party. So there's, there, there's not everything is happy, happy, joy, joy, right? We recognize that there's some pain and there's some suffering in this room, there's some heartache, and there is a time for weeping and embracing, but again, I think Mary helps us look through the pain, looks through the sadness, because when, ba- when Mary looked at Jesus' face, not only did it remind her of the past, of the highs and the lows, but it also propelled her to look forward to the future. There's a song, Mary, Did You Know? I think we all have heard of it, and the song asks this question. Mary, did you know that when you kissed your baby's face, you were kissing the face of God? You guys know that line? You're familiar with that line? Did Mary know who this baby was and that when she was kissing this baby's face, that she was kissing the face of God? What do you think the answer is? The answer is, yes, she knew. The, the angel told her who this baby was. The, the shepherds told her who this baby was. Now, that she know in full? no. She didn't know maybe that he was going to heal the paralytic or the blind man or or raise Lazarus from the dead or ultimately, you know, how that was going to go down, that he would die on the cross and resurrect. She might not know all the details, but she knew this one thing, that he was the Savior of the world and that he has come. Salvation has come. Hope has come. She says this in writing her song in Luke chapter 1, verse 46, and Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Ah, This was just before she started Luke chapter 2 and pondering. She was already pondering. She wrote this great, magnificent, magnificent song to Jesus and who this baby was. And she called him my God and my Savior. She looked forward to who Jesus was will become. And so when you receive this truth and you understand who Jesus is, as we saw the angels make the announcements to the shepherd that he was the Savior, that he was the the Christ, the Messiah, that he was the King, when you see and receive this truth, not only does it help us through the valleys of this time as we look back, but it propels us and makes us look forward to the time that he is going to come back and take care of all of this pain and suffering. It points us to a future day, (coughs) excuse me, when Jesus will come back and set the record straight and make all things new. The sick will be healed, the blind will see, the broken relationships will be restored, and those that have been separated by death will be reunited in eternal life, never to be separated again. I love how it comes in Revelation 21, how Jesus paints this scene for us in Revelation 21, and I'm going to have to get my my goggles out, so bear with me for a second here. This is what he says about this time. John seen, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first time, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne room saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. 
when Mary was holding Jesus and kissing that face, not only did she know that, that she was looking back, but she was also looking forward, that this was the Savior of the world to bring all things together new again. So again, again, the sick will be healed, the blind will see, and the broken relationships will be restored. This is what the incarnation and Christmas is all about. It's about salvation. It's about joy. It's about rejoicing. It's about the birth of our Savior that has accomplished all that already for us. And we are in a state of not yet. We are waiting for the day that he come back again. So we want to be like Mary tonight. We want to treasure and we want to ponder all of the implications that the incarnation brings for you and me. Just like it did for Mary's life, the angel's life, the shepherd's life. All the blessings and all the goodness that it brings. We want to celebrate with great joy tonight and, for, and on. So tonight, tomorrow, pause. Have a moment of meditation. Have a moment of introspection to yourself. And look over your life this last year. And treasure and ponder what the Lord has done. Because we all play a part in God's redemptive story. He is using you and me in his story to bring about redemption, to bring about joy, to bring about salvation in those in our, around our lives. Just like he did with Mary. Mary's situation was unique in that she gave birth to the Son of God, yes. But she was still a human being that God used to bring forth his glory. And so look back on your life and help it maybe propel you to look forward to 2018 and ponder and meditate what the Lord might do in your life. So tonight, enjoy your friends, enjoy your family, enjoy the lights, enjoy the food, enjoy the community, enjoy the friendships, enjoy the games, enjoy the presents, enjoy all the trappings that Christmas brings us. Enjoy that. These are precious gifts from God for you and for me. But then also, also look forward to what will be and to the bigger picture of what Christ has accomplished for you and me in the incarnation. He became poor so that you and I become rich. He was born of a virgin so that you and I might be born of God. He took on flesh so that he might give us his spirit he laid in the manger and died on a cross so that we might live in paradise. And ultimately, he came down from heaven so that he might bring you and me up to heaven. That's what the incarnation is about. And let's meditate and ponder that tonight.